The Arctic is a land of treacherous beauty, dominated by vast, open, rugged landscapes, tenacious wildlife, icy seas, and long days and nights. It is a land of extremes. Anyone who has ever read about European polar exploration or watched a documentary about some doomed expedition knows that the difference between survival and a cold, grisly death is as thin as a razor's edge. The Arctic does not tolerate mistakes and miscalculations. Yet people have lived in the Arctic for thousands of years and mastered the harsh environment. When we conjure up images of the frozen north in our imaginations, the Inuit or Eskimos immediately come to mind as the masters of this beautiful and unforgiving land. But this story isn't about them. This episode is technically about the fascinating Dorset culture and their beautiful art, but in researching this topic and figuring out how I wanted to tell their story, I kept getting pulled further and further back in time across ice, sea, tundra, and whole continents. What should have been a cultural survey turned into a story of Arctic exploration, triumph, and disappearance. As a result of my obsession taking me down the well, this episode could not just be about the Dorset culture, but about the first peoples that settled the Arctic long ago. This is a story that will take us from the frozen north of Siberia to the coasts of Greenland, so get ready, because we are setting out on an odyssey. Before we start this, a few items are in order. First, I have a small admission to make. I didn't pick this topic. That honor goes to my channel patrons. To be honest, I was dreading this selection because my knowledge of this topic was almost non-existent, but I figured that one of the other topics with which I was much more familiar with would win out. To my horror, when voting wrapped up, Dorset culture won in a landslide. Great. Nevertheless, I dived into Dorset culture and was blown away by how much I loved this topic and almost felt ashamed that I had ever doubted it. This is a long way to say thank you to my patrons for pushing me into this extremely rewarding topic last spring. You are all wonderful people of refined tastes. If you, my dear viewer, would like to have input on possible episodes and support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Second, the traditional term used to refer to the peoples of the Arctic before the arrival of the Inuit, or Thule, is Paleo-Eskimo. Eskimo is a term that most modern Inuit and Yupik do not identify themselves with, so ethnographers and archaeologists have been working to decide on new terms for their predecessors. Paleo-Inuit and Pre-Inuit are slowly beginning to catch on, so I'm going to be using Pre-Inuit in this episode, since the ancient Arctic people were not Inuit themselves, but a distinct people culturally and ethnically. I just want to note this in case you do your own reading, which I hope that you all do. Third, I want to point out that the names of the cultures we are discussing, except the Inuit, are all modern names, because we do not know the names that these people called themselves. Finally, I don't speak any Inuit languages, so forgive my pronunciation. Okay, let's get back to the show. The story of humans in the Arctic is fascinating and eye-opening. When we discuss these pre-Inuit peoples, the only source of knowledge we have for them is archaeology with a little modern Inuit ethnography and oral tradition mixed in. Luckily for us, the Arctic is a pretty sweet environment for archaeology. The cold, dry weather preserves archaeological remains well. Geological forces that wreak havoc on the planet move at a much slower pace here. Old hearths and campsites are still exposed on top of the ground just as they were when their owners left them. While materials like furs, fibers, and hides do dissolve in some acidic soils, artifacts made up of wood, antler, and bone dissolve much more slowly than they do elsewhere. Wood in particular can be freeze-dried by the seasonal cold and dry winds and the sub-zero temperatures. If an artifact, even one made from organic material, gets trapped in the permafrost, it can be preserved for centuries. Unfortunately, that means that as global temperatures rise and permafrost thaws, those remains are becoming endangered. Beyond that, there are other challenges that this environment presents. Obviously, Arctic sites are remote and sometimes very difficult to reach, which limits their access. Carbon dating for many of these artifacts is also thrown off by the marine reservoir effect. This is because the carbon consumed by marine animals is usually older than carbon consumed by terrestrial animals. 
This can make carbon dates on marine animals and land animals that ate them imprecise and appear older than they actually are. Even wood dates can be skewed by this. Archaeologists are very aware of this and try to factor in the skewing effect, and they've gotten good at comparing these against terrestrial remains like caribou and muskox bones, which are much less impacted by the marine reservoir effect. With all that said, let's look at the environment we're going to be in for this episode. The Arctic may appear as a frozen wasteland devoid of all life, but nothing could be further from the truth. While it's certainly true that the Arctic isn't exactly a hub of biodiversity, what fauna it does have, it has in abundance, and that's going to be key. The Arctic is a hunter's paradise and a vegetarian's bane. It's home to huge numbers of caribou, muskox, whales, seals, walruses, hares, and Arctic birds. There's a lot to eat out there if you can hunt it, and that depends heavily on the seasons. Summer and winter migrations force these animals to move in predictable patterns that early hunters exploited. Caribou move in the thawing summer to give birth to their calves, whales travel through retreating ice to reach summer feeding grounds, and rivers will swell with salmon and char returning to spawn. Summers are times of bright sunlight and abundance, while winters are cold, dark, and brutal. Anyone settling in the Arctic is going to need to be able to take advantage of the summer months and find a way to survive the harsh winter. Beyond the faunal resources, the Arctic also has many impressive mineral resources that we'll explore later. As the glaciers retreated and exposed these new virgin landscapes, these resources would have been tempting targets for new inhabitants. So who were these new inhabitants? To answer that, we actually have to wind back the clock a few thousand years to trace a very long tradition of Arctic settlement that first shows up in northern Alaska and eastern Siberia. Siberia? Yep. The earliest pre-Inuit group in North America is referred to as the Dengby Flint Complex. They settled in Alaska, particularly in the coastal regions. Tools of the Dengby Flint Complex don't resemble tools from earlier archaic traditions in Alaska, but instead tools of the Silak and Belkachi cultures in Siberia. We often think of North America and Asia as separate continents that were cut off from each other once rising sea levels split the two continents, but that's actually not the case. North America and Asia were, and technically still are, within reach of each other, although the degree to which this was understood by indigenous peoples of the coasts is up for debate. But if you look at the map, it's not an insane distance, about the same as the distance between Haiti and Cuba, for example. Scholars believe that these ancient Siberians crossed over the Bering Strait about 3200 BCE, although how this was done is not entirely certain. Crossings by boat or over sea ice are both theoretically possible. It's also worth noting that this Siberian connection is reinforced by a recent genetic study that linked the pre-Inuit people in Greenland not with other indigenous Americans, but instead to the Chukotko peoples of northeastern Siberia, as well as modern Aleut people. These tools of the Dengby Flint complex are noted for their tiny size and precise flaking. Two particular tools of this culture are small microblades and scrapers, as well as chisel-like burins. This style of tools would persist far beyond the Dengby Flint complex and characterize later pre-Inuit Arctic cultures. In fact, archaeologists refer to these cultures as the Arctic Small Tool Tradition, or the ASTT for those of you who like things abbreviated. When these new immigrants arrived in Alaska, they would have encountered an environment very similar to that of Siberia and would have felt right at home. These people of the Dengby Flint complex would have had access to seals, migratory fish and birds, small game, and large game like caribou and muskox. In some areas, moose and doll sheep would have been present as well. Caribou were especially important for them, not just because of their meat, but their fur and antler. In the winter, they would have tracked and hunted caribou before returning to the coast in the summer to fish and hunt seals. They were a highly mobile people. We also know that they were trading with their neighbors, which is evidenced by recovered obsidian that has been sourced to the Batsatena site along the Koyukuk River, which was outside their area. Even more fascinating is that some obsidian from these sites has been sourced to the Krasnoe Lake in Siberia, which means that it either traveled with the migrants or was traded across the Bering Strait. Another important feature to note are their shelters. The people of the Dengby Flint complex would have used animal skin tents with dugout floors. These are actually very visible in the archaeological record because of the oval tent rings that are left behind from these camps. These might be a solitary tent or a few tents in a small cluster. 
Archaeology shows that these tents were typically not heated by fire, but rather by rocks that were heated in an outdoor hearth. This provided heat without smoke. These were not permanent homes, but rather just seasonal and temporary camps. One important technology that they brought with them from Siberia was the bow and arrow. Two conspicuously absent items from these cultures are sleds and pottery, although pottery does show up later in Alaska. Now the reason I'm going into detail about the Dengby Flint Complex and the Arctic Small Tool Tradition is that these traits I've described are going to persist and develop as people migrate across the Arctic. The people of the Dengby Flint Complex didn't just sit on the Alaskan coast, they moved rapidly across the Arctic. So quick, in fact, that carbon dates across the Arctic show that most of the Arctic was explored in only a few generations. What motivated these people to move is a matter of debate. Their reasons could have been purely economic and motivated by the desire to find better lands for hunting. There's actually some evidence that the Alaskan caribou population decreased after the cataclysmic eruptions of the Aniakchak and Veniaminov volcanoes on the Alaskan Peninsula, which could have been the catalyst for these migrations. We should also note that there may have been social reasons to move into new areas as well, perhaps to escape blood feuds, for example. To that end, some of these people in Alaska began to migrate north following the big game. This eventually brought them to the north coast, near the Mackenzie Delta, which would have been a strangely forested environment dotted with lakes, marshes, and streams. Beyond the delta are what are called the Barren Grounds. This vast open plain that hitherto had never been occupied by humans teemed with muskox and caribou herds. Untapped lakes and rivers were full of fish ripe for the taking. For those pre-Inuit people who first encountered this area, it must have felt like hitting the jackpot. Tracking these herds across the barren tundra would have taken them not just all over North Canada, but to the low Arctic islands. These can be crossed on the ice, which is stable for most months of the year, and caribou do seasonally cross the ice to give birth to their young as far away from the southern forests as possible. Quick detour for a minute because I didn't know where else to discuss this, so we're going to discuss this now. A few of you may be wondering how the Arctic people living in a treeless environment got wood. That's a great question, and the answer is kind of amazing. Those living close to the forests in areas such as the Kobuk River and the Mackenzie Delta and Labrador could and did make excursions to get wood. But for other people in the Arctic, this wasn't a practical option. Yet they still needed wood for building materials, tools, and fuel. So where did they find it? As it turns out, the most reliable source of wood was actually driftwood. Contrary to what you might think, driftwood is a renewable resource. Fallen logs that get swept into rivers will eventually get pushed out to the sea where they will eventually wash up on land. For example, wood in Siberia that ends up in the Lena, Yenisei, or Kalima rivers will get washed out to sea and become trapped in sea ice. The circulation of that sea ice will transport that driftwood as far as Greenland and the eastern Arctic. These cycles of driftwood gave the ancient Arctic peoples all the wood that they needed to sustain themselves. One needs little to imagine the thrill of these early migrants coming upon a virgin beach and seeing huge piles of untouched driftwood. Must have been awesome. For the next several centuries, there appears to have been a pause in pre-Inuit expansion. Now, when I say expansion or settlement, I'm using these in the loosest way possible. When we imagine the Arctic, we aren't talking about a large population of people settling in villages across the landscape. Instead, we are talking about a very small group of people scattered over a vast space. These pre-Inuit populations as a whole would have been very small. The culture of these people in the central Arctic is referred to as pre-Dorset, and it's a pretty loose definition with some regional variability, but we aren't going to go into those details. These pre-Dorset people were still using their microblades and burins and still lived seasonally in their camps and skin tents. However, there is one important change across pre-Dorset culture that we need to look at, and that is the development of sea mammal hunting. At the site of Igloolik on the Canadian coast, we find evidence of toggling harpoons, which are vital for the reliable hunting of sea mammals. Now let's take a minute to explain what exactly a harpoon specifically a toggling harpoon, is for the people who skipped reading Moby Dick. First, a harpoon is not a spear. A harpoon is a specially designed tool tipped with a barbed point that is designed to remain in the target after it's been impaled. 
The harpoon is also threaded with a line so that when it hits the target, the line can be toggled so that the prey can be pulled in. And now we know what a harpoon is. Whether these harpoons were reinvented or always present during the migration is uncertain, but if they were, they must have been of secondary importance to the hunting of caribou and muskox. By focusing on seals, walruses, and smaller whales on the sea ice, rather than the traditional caribou and muskox, they could exploit animals that were not just rich in meat, but also in fat and oil. Now, there's evidence that the pre-Dorset may have still seasonally hunted terrestrial animals, but sea mammals were assuming a new importance, and that trend is going to continue. Perhaps the most important consequence of this was that these skills opened up a new world for expansion, the High Arctic. Igloolik lies on the tip of continental Canada at the Fury and Hecla Strait. Across this body of water is Baffin Island. This and other western islands, like Devon and Ellesmere Island, represented an environmental shift. Gone were the familiar tundra plains, now replaced by the rugged glaciated landscape. This demanded a new approach to hunting, and exploiting sea mammals was key. Thus, around 2500 BCE, people began to move across the ice into these islands, eventually making their way to Greenland. In Greenland, two unique cultures emerged that were different from the pre-Dorset culture that was emerging elsewhere in the Canadian Arctic, and I do briefly want to highlight these, the Independence I culture and the Sakak culture. Both of these cultures represent the earliest cultures in Greenland. They would have arrived in Greenland over the ice across the Nares Strait from Ellesmere Island, Living in Greenland would have been tough and solitary in the winter. A single accident or mishap could easily doom an entire group. The summers, on the other hand, would have been brilliant. Food would have been plentiful, and far-off resources would have finally been accessible. In the far north of Greenland, the sun would have shone for four straight months, which would have granted incredible freedom to those inhabitants. Summers would have been times of reunion with other groups, such encounters would have been marked by the exchanging of materials and stories, meeting new children, mourning losses, arranging marriages between families, and celebrations of dance and song. The Sakak culture inhabited the southern and western coasts of Greenland, and the culture takes its name from a small hamlet on the Nusuak Peninsula. The Sakak are best known for their use of kiliak as their primary tool material. Kiliak is actually a type of slate that has flint-like properties. Access to this material was critical and governed where they settled. They subsisted primarily on big game, marine mammals, migratory birds, and just about everything in between. Like their ancestors before them, they lived in seasonal camps made of skin tents. The Sakak also had a useful invention that allowed them to warm and light their tents, blubber lamps made from soapstone. Since fat and oil burn much cleaner than wood or plant material, it meant that you could light your tent without smoking up the inside. Overall, Sakak culture was very successful, lasting from about 2400 BCE to about 800 BCE at the latest, although I should add that Sakak's settlement was not static and expanded and contracted over time. Meanwhile, on the north coast of Greenland, the Independence I culture, named after the Independence Fjord, were eking out an existence in one of the most remote and harshest environments imaginable. Here, the winters would have been completely dark and incredibly cold. In many areas, sea ice would have been permanent. Although winter hunting was possible due to year-round populations of muskox, meat had to be frozen and cached during the winter, and done so in a way that was safe from foxes and polar bears. The Independence One calling card is their unusual dwellings. These tents have a mid-passage that separates the tent. Some of these excavated dwellings have different tool types on different sides, such as needles, microblades, and projectile points, which suggests that there may have been divisions based on gender and labor. The Independence I culture was shorter-lived than their Sakak contemporaries, and they appear to have abandoned Greenland at about 1900 BCE. This area would later be reoccupied by later Dorset people in two phases. In case you're wondering if there's an Independence II culture, there is, or was, but most archaeologists lump it into the Dorset culture. Pre-Inuit expansion didn't end at Greenland. While the Independence and Sakak cultures were just beginning to enter Greenland, others continued to move farther east. For those on Baffin Island, they could cross the ice into northern Quebec and Labrador. 
This would have brought them into contact with the subarctic indigenous populations that were already living there, although the nature of this interaction is poorly understood. Archaeology in this area has not been as extensive as it's been elsewhere. However, it is worth mentioning this contact because this may have been where the bow and arrow was introduced to the rest of North America, but archaeologists aren't positive. At any rate, by 2000 BCE, all of the Arctic had basically been explored and settled. But remember that when I say settled, we are talking about a tiny population over a huge area in small groups. In Canada and Greenland, pre-Dorset culture was very successful and lasted from 2500 BCE to 700 BCE. If you're curious about what was going on back in northwest Alaska and eastern Siberia, the Dengby Flint complex had evolved into Chorus culture and then Norton culture, but since the later Dorset culture never occupied those areas, we're just going to ignore them for the rest of the episode. Now let's get back to the eastern Arctic where the pre-Dorset people were still chugging. Now based on the dates I just gave you, you should be aware that the pre-Dorset culture didn't last forever, but what brought about their decline, you may be wondering. The better question would be, why did the culture change? Unfortunately for the pre-Dorset, the lands around them were transforming, and not in a great way. Beginning between 2300 BCE and 1500 BCE, a global cooling event began and temperatures began to drop. Now for those of us stuck in a global warming event, a cooling event might sound pretty rad, but to the people living in the Arctic and finely tuned to its seasons, this could be a bit of a problem. Just think if you were living in the Arctic during the winter and had only stocked up on enough meat to see you through until the opening sea ice allowed you to hunt the migrating seals. If that ice opened a month late, you could be in huge trouble. For the local wildlife, this had an impact on available vegetation and probably resulted in new migration patterns. Studies show that the tree line retreated even further south. Environmental shifts and degradation like this forced the pre-Dorset people to change. Some areas like northern Greenland were abandoned completely for centuries, and yet out of this crucible emerged the Dorset. Incredibly, they would come out of this time of crisis and flourish for nearly 1,500 years. So what changed between pre-Dorset and Dorset culture? The most important change the Dorset made in adapting to the climate was that they focused almost full-time on hunting on the sea ice, which was smart because now there was more ice than ever. While some may have seen the ice as a limitation, these pre-Inuit people saw new possibilities. Caribou and muskox hunting in turn became rare. Seal and walrus hunting boomed. In fact, if you look at Dorset settlements, bones from terrestrial animals and birds are rare, while sea mammal bones are very plentiful. However, nothing illustrates this better by looking at what the Dorset abandoned in forging this new lifestyle. The bow and arrow hitherto a vital and important technology for pre-Inuit peoples and the later Inuit themselves, disappears from the archaeological record. That's not the only thing that disappears. There's also little evidence of boats or watercraft, another technology that the Inuit would have considered vital to survival. The only evidence that survives are from small boats that likely could not have been used for hunting. Also suddenly absent are drills. If you ever see a dorset tool or artifact that has a hole in it, it was not drilled out, but instead was made by scraping or gouging out the hole with a blade. Dorset archaeology has been very extensive, and many Dorset sites have excellent preservation, so archaeologists are very confident when they say that these technologies cease to be used. Whether these were lost or abandoned is uncertain. Perhaps bow hunting was no longer seen as efficient as other forms of hunting. Interestingly, a similar phenomenon occurred in historical times with the Polar Inuit living in the far north of Greenland. When these isolated Inuit groups were rediscovered by the Europeans and Inuit, they also lacked the bow and arrow, the fish spear, and even kayaks. These Polar Inuit explained that an epidemic had torn through their communities and killed off the craftsmen and hunters who had carried this knowledge. That's a pretty bleak comparison, but recall that Dorset culture came about during a time of environmental decline, where starvation and hardship may have been tragically common. So perhaps these technological changes do speak to a great loss of knowledge. Personally, looking at how uniform Dorset culture is, I suspect that hardship may have called some of the pre-Dorset population and forged a new way of life. On that grim note, let's shift to a lighter topic and take a look at how the Dorset lived by looking at their settlements. 
The Dorset are known for their unique settlement patterns, which are weirdly consistent over a large area. These settlements are usually made up of four to five dwellings with a large trash midden. The Dorset lived in large rectangular houses, about four by five meters. These were dug about half a meter into the ground with short walls made from rocks or sod. These would have been topped by skin roofs. These shelters didn't have hearths, but instead used blubber lamps to heat them. There's also some evidence based on tent rings that don't actually have a normal ring of boulders around them that the Dorset may have built houses or buildings out of snow or sod like the later Inuit. In fact, snow knives made from antler and ivory have been recovered, and people have suggested that the Dorset may have been the first people to build igloos. However, the most enigmatic structures from later Dorset times are the so-called Dorset longhouses. These mysterious structures are massive and can be anywhere from 10 to 45 meters long. Don't get the impression that these are like longhouses further south in eastern North America. They're so large that they were probably never roofed. They may have been meeting or ceremonial spaces, though some believe that they may indeed be large communal dwellings. These sites with longhouses were probably places where several groups met in the summer to participate in ceremonies, trade goods, meet old friends and kin, arrange marriages, and mourn the dead. This would have broken up the monotony experienced most of the year by living in a tiny band of just a few families. Although some of these were seasonally inhabited, some of the settlements appear to have been inhabited year-round. This was possible because they settled in rich areas that could stock lots of food for the winter, often near polynas that never completely froze. One thing that is conspicuously absent from these settlements are human remains. Dorset burials are very rare, and when they are found, they normally just include partial remains, which has led some to speculate that the dead were exposed to nature, and only occasionally were the bones collected and kept. Dorset culture is unique for its uniformity over a large area, but archaeology shows Dorset occupation shifting through time. Early on, Dorset settlements could be found from Victoria Island to Labrador, and from the northern Hudson Bay to Ellesmere Island and even Greenland. After 1 CE, sites in the High Arctic are almost completely abandoned, and Newfoundland becomes settled. At this point, global temperatures begin to rise again, and the effects of this can be seen in further demographic shifts. By 1000 CE, Newfoundland was abandoned as the temperatures warmed and the seal population moved out. Once again, the High Arctic was occupied until Dorset culture began to retreat in the 14th century, but we'll cover that at the end of the episode. One of the most famous aspects of Dorset culture is their art. Dorset art represents a creative explosion. Art from previous cultures exists, but the Dorset cranked the creative and expressive volume up to 11. Before we dive into Dorset art, however, we need to briefly talk about Dorset beliefs and spirituality. Most scholars agree that the Dorset practice some form of shamanism. I've discussed shamanism in other episodes, but it bears repeating here. In such cultures, the world is divided into various levels, such as a sky realm, an earthly realm, a sea realm, and an underworld realm that are inhabited by various spirits and creatures. Such beings from these realms can influence the human realm for good or evil. By communing with or incorporating the power of these spirits, a shaman can augment their abilities in the real world or journey into the spiritual world to influence the real world from there. In this way, they could cure illnesses, calm the weather, or attract herds of animals before a big hunt. The shaman would have fulfilled the role of priest, doctor, and seer for the community. In this light, Dorset art takes on some very fascinating meanings, though I do want to stress that this isn't the only way to analyze Dorset art, and that other interpretations are possible. What I'm presenting here represents the general consensus. With all that in our heads, let's dive into their art. Dorset art mainly represents individual humans and animals. You won't find any Dorset depictions of landscape or flora. Stylized animals or parts of animals that appear in Dorset art can be seen as an expression of that animal's power. For example, a common animal depicted is the polar bear. To Arctic peoples, the polar bear was the most powerful animal they encountered, and the one that most resembled humans. Depictions of polar bears can be very natural or stylized, but are always masterfully crafted with an attention to detail. Polar bears can be depicted standing, swimming, and perhaps even in flight. These bears in motion may represent shamans possessed by the bear's spirit. 
One of the more interesting bear pieces is this set of crafted bear teeth from walrus ivory that was held in the mouth, likely as part of a shaman's ceremony. Perhaps the shaman wearing these teeth became the bear and assumed its power. Other commonly depicted animals include birds of prey and seals. Human depictions in Dorset art are also common. The best known are these Dorset masks, some of which can be life-size or miniature. Some human portrayals also include animal features such as ears or horns. Life-size masks were likely used in ceremonies and rituals. In rare cases, such depictions of humans can be very natural and even show regularly clothed Dorset people. One of the most bizarre pieces that I came across are caribou antlers that have faces carved into them. Sometimes these can be completely crowded by grimacing faces jockeying for attention. A little creepy if you ask me. These are sometimes referred to as wands, but the purpose of these carvings remains a mystery, but they appear in several Dorset sites and even have similarities to local petroglyphs. Dorset craftsmanship was not just limited to art. Their tools show an incredible degree of sophistication and execution. Thankfully for us, conditions in the Arctic have preserved a wide array of tools, not just from stone and ivory, but from degradable materials such as bone, antler, and wood. So as a result, we have a very good understanding of the Dorset toolkit. Like their ancestors, they continued the tradition of making small, precise tools for all functions. They produced blades for harpoons, lances, knives, burins, scrapers, and adzes. Making these even more impressive is the range of materials that they used in these tools. Chert was the most common material for lithic tools, but other materials, often very difficult to obtain, were prized for their qualities. One of these was nephrite jade, which was exceptionally durable and was a great material for carving ivory and bone. Jade is often found among burial goods of other Arctic cultures, suggesting that it was very prized. Another important stone for making blades was crystalline quartz, which produced very fine blades and edges. Soapstone was also very important for making lamps, but had other purposes as well. Metals were also utilized by the Dorset culture. Native copper, that is, naturally pure copper, occurs in small amounts near the Coppermine River, and the later Dorset began to increasingly use it to craft tools such as knives, points, and awls. Now just to be clear, none of this copper was being smelted or cast, but only cold hammered. If you want more information on how indigenous people used copper, you can check out our copper culture episode. One material that sets apart the Dorset and subsequent Arctic peoples from the rest of the Americas was their use of iron. The source of this iron was a meteor that impacted Cape York in Greenland long ago. In case you think that this was small, one of my sources noted that 58 tons of meteoric material has been identified from the area, and most of it's probably on the ocean bottom. Unlike most iron which is found in the form of ore, meteoric iron is pure iron and doesn't need to be smelted to be crafted. Although it was harder than regular iron and thus more difficult to work with, Meteoric iron was prized for its hardness and durability among Arctic people. Some have even speculated that this iron was a primary factor in later migrations to Greenland. You may be wondering why I'm rambling about these different materials. The reason is that these materials occur naturally in very specific spots. So when jade is found in Greenland or iron is found in the Labrador coast, it means that trade had to be occurring between these small Dorset groups. Remember what we said earlier communities had to have been meeting regularly together during the summers, and these were likely trading events as well as social gatherings. Ethnographic accounts from the Inupiaq people in Alaska note that trade was so important to them that trading events brought an automatic cease in any tribal or clan hostilities, so that everyone, even bitter enemies, could trade with each other. I think we can make an argument that exchange among the Dorset was similarly appreciated. These exchanges were not limited to just the Dorset, however. There is some evidence that trade was being conducted with their neighbors to the south. The most compelling is Rama Flint from northern Labrador. This very unique flint was traded down the east coast and can even be found as far south as New England. Now, some of you history nerds out there who know your northern European history are probably wondering if the Dorset people ever had encounters with the Norse. For those who may be less familiar, Greenland was reached by the Norse and colonized in the late 10th century for the next 400 years or so. In the succeeding decades after the colony's founding, 
Norse explorers continued to explore the eastern Arctic and the Canadian coast, and even set up a temporary camp in Newfoundland at Lanso Meadows. Eastern Canada was a vital source of timber for the Greenland colonies, so these trips were very important. During the three centuries that the Norse were in Greenland, they would have passed the lands that the Dorset inhabited, albeit very thinly. So is there any evidence that the Dorset and Norse peoples ever came into contact with each other? Some Norse sagas do suggest such encounters. In the Floamana saga, there is a reference to witches butchering a seal near a hole in the ice, and another instance where these witches return a lost boat to the Norse. Of course, this saga is not considered reliable as a historical source, so take all that with a grain of salt. However, smelted copper sheets have been found at Dorset sites that are almost certainly of Norse manufacture, but whether these were acquired through trade, a hostile encounter, or a shipwreck is unknown. Cordage has also been recovered on Baffin Island that appears to have been made using similar methods that the Norse were using, However, carbon dates for these are suspiciously early, and some have questioned this find. Others have argued that certain pieces of Dorset art depict European faces rather than indigenous ones. Unfortunately, there really isn't enough evidence to describe any relationship between these people in reliable detail, but it's almost certain that both would have been aware of each other. The Norse certainly may have been interested in trading for walrus ivory or skins when such opportunities presented themselves, but the nature of such interactions, if they occurred, is unknown. However, the real game-changing encounter would come not from the east, but from the west. In the 13th century, the Thule culture, the ancestors of the modern Inuit peoples, began to quickly arrive in the Canadian Arctic. The Thule were extremely well adapted to living in the Arctic with their dog sleds and kayaks. The Thule were such prolific mariners that they could reliably hunt large baleen whales, prey that was far too dangerous for the pre-Inuit peoples to hunt. With dog sleds, they could traverse great distances quickly and safely. Although the Dorset had sleds and dogs, there's no evidence that they ever hitched their dogs to them, and even if they did, they certainly could not have ridden the sled. In fact, evidence of dogs is strangely scant in the archaeological record, which suggests that the dog population among the Dorset was small. Unlike the Dorset, the Thule still had the bow and arrow, and were very effective with it. Inuit oral traditions actually speak of encounters with the previous inhabitants of the land, which they called the Tunit. Whether the Tunit and Dorset are the same people is uncertain. If these are indeed the Dorset, they are the only remaining historical records of the Dorset. To quote an account from the Natsiling Miatut recorded in 1923, the Tunit made our country habitable. They built the lines of boulder cairns which guide caribou to the river crossings, where they can be ambushed by hunters, and they furnish the rivers with fish weirs. Such accounts describe the Tunit as a people of large stature and incredible strength who were gifted hunters. Other accounts note that these people could kill a walrus and carry the entire animal back to a camp. Despite their strength, they were always portrayed as peaceful and timid people, However, in most accounts, after a harmonious coexistence, violence breaks out and the Tunit are quickly put to flight and leave their homeland before disappearing forever. Another story told by Iglulik historian Ivald Wardyuk states, The Tunit were a strong people, and yet they were driven from their villages by others who were more numerous, by many people of great ancestors. But so greatly did they love their country that when they were leaving Uglit, there was a man who, out of desperate love for his village, harpooned the rocks and made the stones fly about like bits of ice. What makes the end of Dorset culture particularly frustrating is that there's barely any indication of it. There's no evidence that the Dorset population began to steadily shrink or dwindle. They just disappear. However, one archaeological site does stand out. Broomin Point on the coast of Bathurst Island. This site has evidence of occupation going back 4,000 years, but we only care about the Dorset and Thule occupations of the site. The Dorset artifacts at the site are exceptionally well-preserved and show almost no evidence of weathering that we would expect from an abandoned site, likely because the pit houses were immediately reused by the Thule. It suggests that the Dorset abandoned the site just before the Thule established a new settlement. Whether this was a peaceful moment or a violent one, we can't tell, 
One way or another, the Dorset were slowly displaced by the rapid and unrelenting Thule expansion. Making this worse was that the Dorset were living in a changing environment again. Near the end of the first millennium CE, the medieval warm period was in full swing and the climate was warming, which meant that the sea ice was retreating and that made hunting sea mammals much more difficult. As displacement intensified amidst a warming climate, the Dorset were probably forced into increasingly inhospitable regions, which made survival through the winter increasingly difficult. The last Dorset settlements do not show them adapting Inuit technology, but continuing their own traditions in the face of mounting isolation. If there was any blending between the two groups, no evidence of it has survived. Interestingly, one quintessential Inuit feature, the igloo, may have originated with the Dorset based on the snow knives that we mentioned earlier, but archaeologists aren't positive of this. Scholars once believed that pockets of the Dorset culture survived as the Saddler Miut in the Hudson Bay and the Angmasalik in southeastern Greenland, but investigation has shown that these cultures are based within the Inuit tradition. Genetic testing has also ruled out any relationship between the Saddler Miut and the Dorset. By 1400 CE, the Dorset culture was extinct, along with all other pre-Inuit cultures. The Inuit were the new heirs to the Arctic. And so we arrive at the end of our odyssey. For nearly 4,000 years, pre-Inuit people adapted to the Arctic and mastered it. The Dorset culture represents the final fluorescence of a long cultural and artistic Arctic tradition. The Dorset and all those that came before them are an important reminder to the resilience of humans. They're a testament to the incredible changes and adversity that people can overcome, and how even in the face of such adversity, lives are still lived and traditions are still passed on. And that's going to wrap us up for today. Special thanks to my patrons listed here. You guys are the best for picking this episode. Hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you would like to join the ranks of these fine individuals and support the show, you can do so on Patreon. The link will be in the description below. Also, a big thank you to the Canadian Museum of History for providing photos for this episode. Don't forget to like and subscribe and follow us on Facebook. Take care, and we'll see you in our next episode.